when we were at the train show, we found some interesting stuff that yes, we just we want to share with you. Yes. One of them isn't anything to do with trains. No. But the museum there also has the Browning collection. Something I've wanted to see the entire of. And uh, they have all of their cars, which, mm -hmm. which we're not going to be showing you. But they have the gun collection. That's wonderful. Ooh. And uh, not guns. only is this one of the best Three collections of feet. guns, firearms, that you will ever see, these are, generally speaking, the prototypes. That's just hard to fathom. The handmade prototype that made in just this little shop yeah. for some of the most famous guns in the world. Right. And all the prototypes were kept by John Browning since right. he built them. Yeah. And uh, and the rest of the family, they were all making guns. It's crazy. And they, uh, they put them all on display. They still own them, but they're there on display in the train station. So right. Check this out, the Browning Well, as was our tradition, we took the train up to the train show. <laughs> right. I love that train show. <laughs> well, and how many times can you take the Front Runner train to a train show? But the Ogden train show is one of our favorites. It is, and it's coming right up, too. Yeah, March, is March, it? first yeah. part of March. So this is last year's train show. One of the really neat things about the Ogden train show is it takes place in the Ogden Union Depot, which is also Utah State Railroad Museum. That is fun. And so you get to see all of this really cool stuff, uh, the models and, and well, the, the whole railroad museum. Exactly. And upstairs, the Browning Gun Collection. Now, I always wanted to go in there. And, and here it is, check it out. So the history of the Browning family starts here in Nauvoo, Illinois. Uh, Jonathan Browning, John's father, was a Mormon. He converted to Mormonism and was running this gun shop in Nauvoo, where all the Mormons lived. Back then, a lot of guns were made just one at a time. This was the early, early days of mass production, and a lot of gunsmiths like Browning just handmade guns one at a time. Here are three examples of Jonathan Browning's handmade firearms. It's always impressive to see these handmade guns. They're actually works of art. Yeah, it's, I don't know, anything handmade instead of mass produced. Right, it's unique. Well, as a lot of people know, uh, the Mormons started a long trek in the 1840s leaving Nauvoo and heading for what became the Utah Territory. And it was then that Jonathan Browning uh, had a son, John M. Browning, born in 1855 in Ogden, Utah. And John literally grew up playing with guns right there in his father's workshop. He constructed his first handmade rifle at age 13 in his father's gun shop. Part of the success of John Browning is, of course, just timing. He was born just barely before the Civil War and started making guns at a time when there were huge advancements being made in gun technology, including mass production. And this, of course, leads to the Browning dynasty, if you will. Uh, John's uh, son Val took over the company, and then later on Bruce Browning took the reins of the Browning Company. So in his 20s, John Browning opened his own little gun shop, not far at all from the depot and right near where his collection is currently housed. By now, most of the guns are being manufactured by big companies and a lot of what they were selling here were more mass produced guns and they were just doing repair work of guns that they were selling. So with the advent of mass production, Browning uh, sat here at his bench in that little gun shop, coming up with new mass producible designs that would be considerably more advanced than the earlier guns made here on the hand lathe. He was working in conjunction with Winchester and they were developing a new cartridge, the 3030 cartridge, which had a groove at the back of the cartridge instead of a flange to facilitate ejecting uh, the spent brass. And well, frankly, he started making a lot of money and he constructed this beautiful home. Still there in Ogden, this is a very recent photograph of that. 
And in just an incredibly short period of time, he was able to come up with a bunch of new designs for very advanced guns. And up on the second floor of the museum is his whole gun collection, all of his prototypes. (laughs) And you know, a, a lot of people have no idea it's up here. No. Most people who come to the train show never even come up here. And they should. This is like uh, one of Utah's best kept secrets. Yes, it's wonderful. Browning's earliest guns are just these uh, single shot guns. You load a bullet, you pull the trigger, and it fires. But Browning's goal was to build a gun that you could load with several rounds, and he developed this, a slide action gun, which he called the trombone action, where you could chamber a new round and then fire the gun again and the gun could hold several rounds. Then came this infamous weapon, which he developed for Winchester, which he called the Flapper Action Rifle. Winchester didn't care for that name, so they changed it to the Lever Action Repeating Rifle. Winchester started manufacturing these guns in the 1880s, and in the early years, they went through a lot of design changes, and all of those prototypes are here in the collection. The gun on the top here is one of the millions of guns mass produced. The one directly below it is the prototype for the Model 92. Browning built a lot of different prototypes for this gun and they are all on display here in the Browning collection. The Army of course adopted this, Uh, the cavalry carried them, people bought them by the thousands, well millions, millions actually it became known as the gun that won the West. But this gun perhaps represents Browning's greatest achievement, the gas-operated automatic rifle, which he built in 1889. It's really just a modification of his flapper gun, only in this case, the high-pressure gases inside the barrel are trapped here at the end of the muzzle, and that is used to cock the lever, causing the gun to fire around every time you pull the trigger. The world's first semi-automatic rifle. The uh, newfangled bullets with the brass cartridges were inserted into a magazine, and the magazine was loaded here into the top of the gun, feeding the rounds one at a time to the gun every time you pull the trigger. Browning also quickly realized that he could use the recoil of the gun to chamber a new round and was developing rifles that used both technologies. These are prototypes for three different variations of a gas-operated semi-automatic rifle. And Browning very quickly realized with the slightest modification to this, he could set it up so that the gun would continue to fire for as long as you depressed the trigger, becoming a fully automatic rifle. The problem with that design being that it would very rapidly overheat and jam. Now here we can see some prototypes for handguns that use that exact same technology, a semi-automatic handgun, which uses something Browning called a telescoping bolt. And after messing around with this design, he improved it with what he called a slide action bolt. And the slide action handgun is, well, almost all guns today are slide action handguns. Here we can see the prototype for the slide action 45 caliber automatic pistol from 1911, licensed to Colt. Here again, the pistol on the top is a production model, a mass-produced Colt production model, the pistol below that being John Browning's original prototype. Working with Colt, Browning went on to develop dozens of new handguns, slide-action, semi-automatic handguns. These are all Browning's handmade prototypes and test weapons. Some of these guns are still manufactured to this day, but the design has been borrowed by every pistol manufacturer in the world. All semi-automatic handguns follow Browning's original design. Here we see the prototype for another Browning gun, which is very, very famous, very well recognized. The Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR, which was built for the military. Browning created this to be an assault rifle 
and it was used in both of the world wars, Korea, and even continued on into Vietnam. And Browning used the same technology to develop a series of large caliber machine guns for the military. The largest of these guns is technically a machine cannon. It fires a 37 millimeter round, the M4 automatic cannon. Just after the turn of the century, Browning developed a 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun. What we see here is one prototype and some parts from another of these 30 caliber machine guns. In this case, Browning solved the overheating problem by surrounding the barrel with a jacket of water. Some of these guns even had a pumping system to bring fresh, cold water up to the barrel. They were so large and cumbersome that they were typically mounted on a vehicle. But a crew of several individuals could take one of these out into the field and set it up on a tripod. While a 30 caliber gun, it used a much larger powder charge around known as the 30-06. Browning scavenged parts off of his original prototype from 1901. All that remains is the receiver that you see here. The other gun on display being the prototype from 1910. These original receivers had a, a major design flaw in them. In actual combat situations, the bottom plate of the receiver would tear completely away from the gun. And Browning also made an air-cooled version of the same gun, much lighter. What you see here is an oversized copy of that used in training. Because these guns could fire up to 450 rounds per minute, a mechanical magazine was no longer an option, so Browning developed a cloth feed belt. And here again we see another prototype for a legendary Browning gun, in this case the M2 50 caliber machine gun, affectionately known by the troops as the Ma Deuce. It was designed clear back during World War I, but it didn't go into service until 1933, and it's still very much in use. Now, also in the collection are all these little miniature guns. Now that's right up my alleys. <laughs> I love these. Uh, some were made by the Browning family, a lot were made by other people, and uh, the Brownings have simply collected them. And a lot of these are fully functional. I know, isn't that, that's just neat. That's just neat. They're about one quarter scale, uh, <laughs> some a little smaller than that, but all of these great little miniature guns. And the, the craftsmanship, good grief, look at that. Just wonderful. Look at the wonderful tooling on this leather holster. Isn't that beautiful? And, oh. and the picture doesn't do it justice. It's just teeny. Yes, right. If you're watching it on an iPhone, it might be about the right size. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even uh, engraving, uh, look at this pair of matchlock pistols. Oh, wonderful. And just uh, uh, carved ivory on this wheel lock. Just really amazing little works of art. You know, I think people have been building miniature guns just about as long as they've been building guns. Probably. Anything tiny like that's <laughs> collectible. <laughs> and, and mostly, of course, historic guns. If you're going to build a miniature of a gun, you want to build something uh, really famous or even infamous. Exactly. You know, one of my favorite guns has always been the Tommy gun. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know. They're just... Uh, the, the machine gun, the typewriter. The Chicago typewriter. The Chicago typewriter. <laughs> this one has the drum magazine on it, which oh. is just such a cool look. And then here's the same gun, only with the, uh, the, the linear magazine, the non-drum magazine. And here we have a miniature of Browning's famous 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun. Oh, wow. That is cool. Isn't it? <laughs> Since it's water-cooled, of yeah. course. But how neat is it that uh, one of uh, John Browning's most uh, famous guns is here as a miniature, as well as uh, this Luger. You know, uh, Luger was another company that was licensing Browning designs. And you recognize these. Of course. <laughs> Your dad built these. <laughs> My dad was always building little miniature things. Yeah, so mm -hmm. he built miniature guns as well. So yes. Those are in the living room. They are. 
And they have this really cool display on the art of gun engraving. That's something I would like to learn to do. Yeah, I've watched people do it uh. and it's magic. You know, I have no idea how you take a raw piece of metal like this and then just using sharpened little tools, carve all of this intricate tooling right into the metal. Look at that. That is just beautiful. It's art. It, it's truly art. And a lot of uh, what they have here, of course, just the pieces of the guns, the engraved pieces. And they also have a lot of complete guns. But the goal being to show off the, uh, the incredible art of gun engraving. As my custom, I always have to video us leaving the train show because we have such beautiful sunsets. Always a great way to cap off a great train show. Exactly. South Salt Lake City. That is amazing. just flat amazing. Oh, such beautiful work. I don't, I don't even know how. Uh, it's, it's one thing to, to say that you're going to manufacture a gun. It's, a, it's another thing to manufacture a gun that works. The, the not only works that works really, really well. And is a work of art at the same time. And then is a work of art with all the engraving, um, the, the hand tooling, mm. the scroll work and everything. Wow. And then these are handed off to the big manufacturers, Colt, Winchester, and uh, they're mass produced by the millions. Oh. And uh, I think pretty much everybody that has guns has at least one Browning oh, gun. Oh, at least, and, and I imagine. Yeah. They're just, they're just ubiquitous. Just beautiful. They're just well, if you haven't been to the channel, pop over there and binge watch everything in the world. And while you're at it, subscribe. Yeah. You ready for the subscribe button? Here, Here it comes. Goes. Right there. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here on Tuesday or Sunday. Let's see what you want to So we'll see you here on Sunday. Driving around. <laughs> okay, we'll see you. Bye-bye.